You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode we're going to show you how to make a very simple plasma arc lighter. Okay, so before we jump into building the project, I actually have two letters today, so let's go ahead and take a look at those. This first letter comes from Mason Blonde from Indiana. It says currently he's working on the AM transmitter that we built. And it also says that him and his friends are buying old broken or used computers or parts and then trying to refurbish them. And so that's pretty cool, I think. And it also says that he has a YouTube channel called Stop Motion Animations 1721, and so I'll have that linked down in the description below if you want to check that out. Next, we have a letter from Washington by someone named Thomas Appel. And so he also has a YouTube channel about physics and electronics. And so his YouTube channel name is called AC Voltage, but I'll have that link to the description below as well, so you can click on that and check it out as well. Thank you guys again so much for sending me these letters. Once again, um, their information will be linked down in the description below if you want to check it out. But let's go ahead and put this on the letter wall back here. And so, without further ado, let's jump straight into building the project. Here's the schematic for our project that we'll build. Basically what's happening here is that we have a flyback setup in order to generate a high voltage across this. And so right here we have our primary coil, here's our secondary. And right over here is going to be our feedback coil. And so basically what's going to be happening here is that when we press the button, a voltage is going to flow through, go down through here, go through our feedback coil, which I guess in this case is actually going to be used as a primary coil in the setup I have here, but uh, I'm just going to call it a feedback coil anyways. It's going to go through that feedback coil and then go through here and then go to the gate of our MOSFET. Now MOSFETs do work kind of like an electrical switch, meaning that if we apply a current from the gate to the source of the MOSFET, it'll allow current to flow from the drain to the source of the MOSFET. And so when that current flows through that coil and then goes to here, it'll activate the MOSFET, thus allowing current to flow through the primary coil, going down through the drain to source to ground. However, something interesting happens here. When the primary coil gets the current flowing through it, it allows the secondary coil's magnetic field due to inductance to collapse in on itself, and that produces the electrical spark up here, but also it produces a counter field to that feedback coil. And when that happens, it doesn't allow current to flow to that gate anymore, so thus it shuts off the transistor. And then in the process of shutting off the transistor, it allows the inductors to reset themselves pretty much, and then it just resets over, producing sort of an oscillation like a square wave. Or I guess it probably wouldn't look like a square wave. It'd probably be a little bit smoother, but similar enough. Uh, sorry, that was kind of a barrage of words, I suppose. Let me try and simplify it down a little bit. When we apply electricity through a coil, it makes a magnetic field. And then um, if that magnetic field collapses back down in on the coil, it creates electrical current. That process of the magnetic field collapsing back in on itself on this side is what creates the opposite force inside of this coil, thus shutting off that and acting like an oscillator, thus making it so that we get a voltage induced inside the secondary coil here. So yeah, that's uh, in layman's terms basically what's happening here. Now this ratio of low turns to high turns is important because basically if you can visualize in your mind the current going around in it, if you have the lower turns it's going to be pushing more electrons inside the higher turns, and this correlates to a higher voltage. In fact, the formula for it goes, the voltage in the secondary is going to be equal to the primary turns times the secondary turns divided by the primary voltage. And so basically, let's plug in some numbers and see what happens with this formula. Say if our primary turns was 4 and our secondary turns was 1000 and the voltage across the primary was 20, what is that going to equal? Well, then we have 4000 divided by 20, which is 200 volts. Now, of course, it's important to remember that we're not gaining power. There's no new energy being created. It's not a perpetual motion machine or anything like that. Basically, our formula for power is power equals current times voltage. And so that's going to be conserved across to this. We're just going to have a lower current on the secondary than we did on the primary in order to have that higher voltage. Okay, so let's lay out our pieces that we'll be using when building this. And so first here, I have this IRFP 260N MOSFET. The next thing we need is an 150 ohm resistor, so I have this 100 ohm resistor, and then I'm just going to add on this 50 ohm resistor right next to it. Now this is a pretty small resistor right here, and normally I'd be concerned about the heat dissipation through it and worried that it would burn out. However, since this is going to be a push button thing, and it's only going to be really used momentarily, not being held on, I'm not really going to be too concerned about that, to be honest. Next we have a push button momentary switch here. Uh, these are very cheap, you can get them on eBay for probably like $2 for 500 or something like that, is I think what I got from it. Uh, but yeah, they're very cheap, and they're pretty useful. And lastly, we just need the transformer. Now you could wind this yourself by putting a few turns of the primary and thousands of turns of the secondary in a very thin wire, but I think that would take quite a while, um, especially if you're not using a screwdriver or something like that. However, I did find these transformers on the internet, and they're pretty cheap. They're like 79 cents, and they will accomplish the same goal, and I think for 79 cents it saves enough time to make it worth it. It would be fun to wind your own transformer, but uh, it's a time saver definitely to use this thing. 
And so yeah, that's really all the components that we'll be needing. Now we just need to connect it up onto a breadboard. And so let's go ahead and do that. The first thing is we solder jumper wires onto this transformer. Now I just did this mainly for showing it to you guys for setting it up. However, if you guys are doing this at home, I wouldn't really do this and I would just skip to soldering the regular wires on it that you'll be using for your final project later on. However, basically from this transformer, we have two thin wires which are going to compose our feedback coil, and we have two thick wires which are going to compose our primary coil. And this is uh, the feedback and primary coil in configuration with the circuit that we just drew. And the other two insulated wires we have going out over here is going to be where our secondary coil or high voltage coil is basically going to be outputting. Now if your transformer looks a little bit different, one thing you can do is use an ohm meter to test the resistance across the coils. And the secondary coil, since it has the most turns, should be the most resistant. And so basically you'll get a higher reading on that one, while the uh, primary coil and feedback coil will have much lower resistances. And so as per the circuit, you can see that one end of the primary coil and one end of the feedback coil are both connected up to voltage positive. And so I'll begin by inserting the primary coil and feedback coil into this positive rail over here. Next we can see that the feedback coil is connected through this 150 ohm resistor to the gate of our MOSFET. And so I'll take the feedback coil and insert it into this row, then use those two resistors to bring it over to an open rail. Now we can see that the 150 ohm resistor needs to be connected up to the gate of the MOSFET. Now for most MOSFETs it goes from left to right for the pinout, gate drain source. And so yours may be a little bit different than that, so I recommend that you Google the part number found on it and click on the datasheet. And on that datasheet it should give you the correct pinout. But yeah, like I said, most MOSFETs are in that configuration already. And so we'll just take that MOSFET and connect its gate to the end of that resistor by inserting it into the breadboard right there. Now according to our schematic, the other end of our primary coil needs to be connected up to the drain of the MOSFET. And so I'll just take that, which is the screen wire for me, and I'll connect it up to that middle pin. And the very last thing we need to do for a complete circuit is connect up the source of the MOSFET to our ground connection. Now, since I do want to push button and I forgot to put it in on the positive end, we'll just insert it on the ground connection and it should work just fine. And so I'll just insert that in between these two rows here, and then connect one end of the button to the source of our MOSFET. And then I'll take another wire from the other end of our button going over to the negative rail. And just like that, our circuit is complete! So yeah, like I said, this is a very simple circuit. Let's go ahead and connect up our power supply and see if it works well. Okay, so now I have it hooked up to a 9 volt battery, and I have the two I voltage wires placed approximately that far apart. So as you can see, when I hit the button, we get an arc of electricity across it. Now this arc of electricity is extremely hot, and to prove that, let me go ahead and hit the button and then put this paper next to it. So three, two, one. And as you can see, it lights on fire very quickly. And that of course goes every time we hit the button. And so now that we know that all of this works, let's go ahead and solder it together, and I'm going to try to put it into a casing. Now I'm going to try and fit it in the bottom of one of these boost converter casings here, and it's going to be extended probably by about that much, but it'll still be very cool. And so basically what I'm going to do is build it into our project that was the uh, pocket stun gun that we made a little while ago, and that's going to also then now have a plasma arc lighter onto it. And so if you want to see how we made the pocket stun gun, I'll have that linked in the description below so you guys can build it. It's also extremely cheap, it cost me probably around $3 in total to build. And it outputs quite a powerful arc. It just isn't as good at starting fires as this um, arc lighter is. And so basically what'll happen is that I'll have the exact same circuit as we had in our pocket stun gun video, except we'll attach this circuit also onto it with two separate switches. That way one switch will be to activate the pocket stun gun, while the other one will be to activate the arc lighter. And so yeah, I think that'll be pretty cool. I'll be right back with you guys and I'm done with that. Okay, so now I have all the wires soldered together, and I'll be right back with you guys again in one more moment when I finish up uh, making it look a little bit more presentable. And now my arc lighter slash pocket stun gun is complete. As you can see, it has two buttons on it. The bottom button activates the stun gun. Now as you can see, I did obviously decide to scale down the arc a little bit. That's just because I simply realized that I had no need for such a big arc. Because just for the simple task of lighting paper on fire, this does the trick just fine, so there really is no need for a bigger arc. Now I really made this with the thought of lighting fuses with it in mind, so let's go ahead and see if it can light a fuse. Let's see. Yep, and as you can see it works just fine for that. So now you guys know a quick and easy way to make an effective arc lighter. Thank you guys all so much for watching the video. I have a few quick announcements. So I think I want to try out the whole YouTube live stream thing, and so I think I'll try to do that Friday. And so if you guys want, down on my Keystone Science Twitter page, I'll post when I'm doing it, and yeah, you guys should come see, and it'll be fun, I think. Second off, if you guys ever need help with anything, you can either message me, and I'm happy to help you guys with it, but we also have a Discord chat server, and that may be quicker to get a response from. On that Discord chat, there are plenty of people who are very happy to help each of you. And so if you guys want to join that Discord or check it out or just say hi to everyone, then that code is right here, but I'll also have it in the description if you don't want to look at it right here for some reason. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a thumbs up as it really helps the channel. And if you'd like to see my science videos, go ahead and hit the subscribe button so I'll show up in your subscription newsfeed. Now the project we built today isn't really that dangerous at all, but you can still char your skin with it. So with that said, please remember to be safe. 
and have a wonderful day. You're watching Keystone Science. And in today's episode, we're going to be building an electromagnetic levitator.